Hey folks, in this video I'm going to be analyzing another game submitted via our Patreon and this game is going to give us a chance to talk about um, some classic aspects of the Rui Lopez and some typical ways that White can often develop in order to get a, a nice and comfortable position out of the opening. So this game was submitted by Joe Vogg, who is around uh, 1700 online rating, I believe. Uh, their opponent is also around 1700, and this was a classical game with a time control of 60 minutes and zero second increment. Um, so as you can see, we had a Rui Lopez on the board, and here Black plays the move Knight G7, uh, which I believe is called the uh, the Cozio defense. And yeah, this is kind of an interesting scheme. It's definitely not considered to be one of Black's most uh, solid approaches to the Rui Lopez. The Berlin with Knight F6 and the, the classical approach with A6 are still uh, by far, in a way, the most popular here. But Knight E7 definitely has um, its... Um, fans because it does defend the knight on c6 so black can prepare recapturing with this other knight and there are different ways black can develop here um, the classic way has always been to bring this knight over to g6 and then develop the bishop to e7 the other one to d7 and so on um, but nowadays a lot of players will also play the setup with g6 and bishop to g7 uh, which is kind of a more active more dynamic way to handle the position so there's different things that White can do here. Um, I actually received a question on this variation um, for a recent opening lab that I did on this channel. And uh, I'm definitely a fan of the move knight to c3 here um, before castling and playing for a quick d4. And um, one of the uh, points of, of this line, and, and you can check out the video if you want kind of more detail on it, is that when black plays g6 here, White has this nice way to fight for the initiative with d4 e takes d4 and now knight to d5 where black actually has uh, some trouble dealing with this it's only a temporary pawn sacrifice because white is going to be winning this pawn back at some point and having a nice position uh, and in the meantime black has to worry about the weakness of the f6 square knight takes d5 e takes d5 leaves this knight without a great square to jump to and then queen takes d4 coming um, so this is i think kind of uh, an annoying initiative for black to deal with and that's just my personal recommendation how I think white should approach this opening. Of course, black can also play knight to g6, and then we get kind of a different kind of position, but again, d4 and playing in the center, I think, is, is the way to go. Um, but in any case, in this game, we get castles. Now, once again, black has a lot of options here. They can go for a setup with knight to g6, followed by bishop to e7, or they can fianchetto the bishop with g6 and bishop to g7. And nowadays, um, players are playing both uh, of these ways. In this game, black goes a6, and uh, white drops back, bishop a4, black pushes b5, bishop to b3, and now black plays knight to g6. And uh, here black is kind of indicating that they want to go for the classic approach with bishop e7, uh, d6, bishop to d7. Um, this was, I think, pretty popular back in the day, maybe in the 1940s, 1950s. And in fact, if you want to study a really classic game uh, that kind of features this structure, um, I would recommend the game Smyslov Ryshevsky from 1948. It's actually a pretty classic game. It's in a, quite a number of books. Um, but to quickly show the move order of that game, because it was a little different, uh, in the game I just quoted, Smyslov Ryshevsky, Black played a6, the classic way, d6, so this is known as the, uh, the deferred Steinitz uh, variation, where Black plays an early d6. But we essentially get the same position, because Black goes for knight e7, bishop d7, um, h6 is included, knight d2, knight g6, and then black plans of putting the bishop on e7. So you want, if you want to see a really well-played game uh, where Smyslov just kind of uh, takes, gets an advantage out of the opening and then converts it very, very efficiently, definitely check that game out. I'll leave it in the description below. Um, and just to show one more move, in that game Smyslov went for this plan to play knight c4, followed by bringing the knight to e3 and then controlling both the d5 and the f5 squares. Um, so that was how he played it, but returning to our game, we see that we have one big difference here, and that is that black has played this move b5. So white doesn't really get the same uh, plan available to them, knight d2, knight to c4. Um, but when I saw this game, because white ends up getting a, a very nice advantage in just a couple of moves, thanks to this move a4, um, I remembered uh, a story uh, when I was doing commentary a couple of years ago, uh, I was working with Grandmaster Georgi Kashashvili and uh, Grandmaster Irina Krush 
Um, this was several years ago, so I, I think I was still an FM back then, uh, and I think Irina was actually an IM back then as well. Um, but it was the three of us covering some uh, top tournament, and there was some Rui Lopez on the board. And I remember Georgie said, like, well, as we know, you know, the whole point of the Rui Lopez is to provoke black into playing a6, b5 on the queen side, so that white gets this hook to attack with a4. Uh, and so he was saying that that's just the whole point of playing bishop b5 in the opening to put pressure on this knight on c6, so that black is one day provoked to kick the bishop, and then white can attack this weakness in the future. And I think both me and Irina were like, wow, we never heard that. <laughs> it was kind of like a today I learned kind of moment, and so, okay, now I'm sharing the wisdom uh, with you guys. And yeah, actually, I really um, felt that come to light in, in this game because um, right out of the opening, you know, I think white goes for a very reasonable setup with c3, uh, d4. It was already possible to play a4 in this position and uh, give black kind of a difficult choice. And indeed, this is something that white often wants to play for in the Rui Lopez, just to put a little bit of pressure on this pawn. And we'll see that it actually causes some great difficulties for black um, in the game as well. So the game goes c3, d6, d4. Now black plays h6. I think this is a little bit too slow. Knight g5 um, is a threat in the position, but it's much more natural for black to cover it with a developing move. Bishop e7, taking the square under control, and then black is ready to castle, and then can play h6 in the future if they need to. But starting with h6 definitely feels a little bit slow. Um, and here I think uh, Joe plays the right uh, way. He just strikes on the queen side with a4. And now black has a really tough choice. If black tries to push past with b4, this not only surrenders the c4 square to white's knight, it also gives white ideas of playing a5 and bishop a4, and the knight on c6 here is uh, really, really a big target. There's ideas of d5, bishop d5 as well is a problem, and yeah, this is a very, very risky position for black to get themselves into. Uh, so after a4, black goes bishop to d7. Uh, which I think is quite reasonable. In case of something like bishop b7, we get a very similar situation, and white can already get a very healthy advantage with something like a takes b5, trading rooks on a8, and then just going after the pawn, going after the queen side with knight to a3. And in here black is still, you know, one or two moves away from castling because they, they've been a little bit slow with the development, but they're not really in time because we're putting pressure on this pawn. If b4, the knight can jump into b5, hitting this one, and then black now has to defend the c7 pawn, and so with every move, white is kind of getting to bring in more and more pieces, uh, starts to create a lot more threats here, and yeah, black is just not getting out of this opening alive. So already black is experiencing uh, huge problems, we're only on move 9 in the game, uh, plays bishop to d7. And uh, here Joe goes bishop to d5, which I think was a really... Um, natural move that just creates a pin, puts some pressure, asks black, you know, how are they going to deal with uh, this pin on this diagonal, also the pressure along the A-file. Um, I just want to point out another move that I think is would be giving white a, quite a nice advantage um, would be the somewhat counterintuitive D takes E5, which at first doesn't feel quite right because it seems like white is just giving away the center, um, but the point is white has this very thematic idea with queen to D5 and all of a sudden, black's position is just collapsing. F7 is hanging, uh, b5 is hanging, the queen can't move off of the back rank because a takes b5 and the rook on a8 is hanging. And we can see white combining threats on the king side with uh, this threat against the b5 pawn. If black's pawn was back on b7, none of this would be quite uh, as strong for white. So that means that black would have to take back with a piece on e5, but then white can immediately build a strong initiative with something like trading and pushing f4, and yeah, black is still just underdeveloped in this opening, and all of white's pieces are coming out. Queen can come to h5, the knight can come in, and yeah, white just has a big, big lead in development here. Very, very nice initiative. So that was an option that I think was already um, quite uh, nice for white, but we get bishop to d5, which I think was also a very reasonable move. Black goes bishop to e7. Uh, now white takes on b5, trades on a8, and goes after black's weakness with knight a3, which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, as it turns out, white ends up missing kind of a concrete tactic that um, actually could have more or less won the game uh, on the spot, or at least given white a, a big advantage. If you want to pause the video at this point and try to figure it out for yourself, I would encourage you to do so. Um, but actually, once again, this surprising move, d takes e5, is very, very nice for white. 
the main point here is that black can actually not recapture with the pawn because the bishop on d7 is a target and white has the trick bishop takes f7 check king takes f7 queen takes d7 white has won a pawn black's king is weak and yeah white is just crushing here so because of this um, idea bishop takes f7 black is actually just not able to take back on e5 because there's actually not enough uh, pieces if knight takes e5 white takes this knight is pinned, and once again, if pawn takes, there's bishop takes f7. So at this point, black's best is actually just to let white take another pawn and play something like castles. e takes d6, bishop takes d6, and then white is just a very healthy pawn up. Definitely the game is uh, far from over, but okay, very, very nice advantage for white with just a healthy extra center pawn. So that's actually kind of a surprising tactic. You know, it feels like this e5 square is black's stronghold, but course these are the things that happen when uh, a player doesn't complete their development sometimes there can be you know tactical accidents in uh, the opening but again it all comes down to this queenside pressure because without uh, trading on a8 and forcing black's queen away from defending the bishop none of these tactics uh, would work out now the way joe plays it ends up giving him a good position as well he goes knight a3 uh, queen to b8 and queen to b3 hitting the pawn on f7 and the pawn on b5. Uh, I'm not sure exactly um, what black's intentions were here, but black ends up castling, which um, definitely feels like a reasonable move, but does leave the b5 pawn undefended. Black could have definitely defended a lot better here with this move knight to d8. Possibly this one was just missed. It's not an easy move to see, backwards move. But the knight covers f7, the bishop covers b5. And actually black creates a pretty annoying threat of c6. and going after white's bishop so this would have actually i think left the game in a very unclear territory but yeah not an easy move to find so black misses it black castles instead and now white takes on b5 and what happens in the game is black just trades on b5 knight takes b5 and white is left with a very healthy extra pawn as it turns out black actually missed uh, another uh, trick here that would have more or less equalized the game. Let me flip the board. If you'd like, you can pause the video and try to see for yourself if you can find it. It's kind of black to play and equalize. And yeah, as it happens, black can actually make this move knight takes d4 work, which is uh, a very nice trick. Now, the first point to see, of course, is that, okay, we're hitting the queen on b5. And if white trades on b8, we, then we're going to throw a knight takes f3 check. So queen takes b8, knight takes f3. White takes back, rook takes b8. Material is equalized, but white's pawns on the king side have been weakened, and yeah, now black is uh, totally fine, maybe even more than fine. Um, but the, the real point to see, because it's easy to discard this move, because it looks like queen takes d7, white is just taking a piece, um, the deeper point that black would have to see is that there's knight e2 check. And after knight takes c1, rook takes c1, queen takes b2, Black is winning back the piece. So this was the real problem. I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the black player here did consider this move, but kind of rejected it because of queen takes d7, um, not seeing the, let's say, further detail of knight e2, knight takes c1. And then, yeah, in the game, or in, in this line, black does win back the material and is uh, totally fine in the end. So this is kind of a computer tactic that black needed to see. But after the trade of queens, well, now white is just a pawn up and, and doing uh, really well. Uh, now, Joe does make a mistake uh, right away with b3. Um, and I think neither player really notices this possibility that black can go knight a5, hitting the knight on b5, and also threatening c6, going after white's bishop. So this would have been a very annoying move for white to deal with because the bishop is uh, simply caught. The knight on b5 is under attack as well. So, for example, knight a3, c6 and white has to give up the light square bishop and is losing uh, you know, a huge chunk of, of their advantage. So that one is missed by both players, but of course b3 was not necessary. In fact, um, the only thing b3 does is just restricting uh, white's bishop on d5. Uh, definitely we needed to be a little bit more concerned about this potential discovery. Um, now knight takes d4 is under control because white can just recapture and doesn't lose any material, but yeah, b3 gives black a very, very easy target with knight to a5. So white needed to just develop here, bishop e3, keep squares open for the bishop, get the rook to the a file, and would have a pretty serious advantage. Um, but b3, rook e8 is played, rook to e1. Now black does go for this knight takes d4 trade. White takes back, e d4, knight takes d4. 
Joe writes in uh, his notes that he wanted to control the c6 square, um, but yeah, I should say c takes d4, probably the more natural way to recapture just in general in these positions. You know, we want to connect our two pawns in the center, and c6 is not such a problem. The bishop can drop back to c4, even to d3 if needed, and yeah, I like white's very uh, healthy center here, and white has kept their extra pawn, so things are, things are looking good. In any case, we get knight takes d4, knight e5, white pushes f4, uh, and now black goes for this counterattack with c6, which simply just doesn't end up working out. White ends up getting uh, quite a strong mass of pawns. Um, black could have stayed in the game here with something like knight d3, and then either just bringing the knight back to c5, or possibly even taking on c1. Um, I think taking on, uh, or bringing the knight back to c5 is a little better, just because it puts pressure um, on the e4 pawn, and really just doesn't make it easy for white. Um, but yeah, black goes for... Um, some tactical counterplay with c6, but simply doesn't work out. White takes on e5, c takes d5, and now white just takes on d6. Black decides to take on e4 with the rook, allowing white to trade rooks, and we end up in this endgame. White has kept the extra pawn, but as we see from the structure, white now has three connected pass pawns on the queen side. Black has four versus two on the king side. So very, very dynamic pawn imbalance. Um, but white's pawns are, are simply unstoppable. C4, B4, C5 is coming. Whereas black's pawns are a lot slower and can be blockaded on the dark square. So essentially black is left with just a hopeless game here. I think it would have maybe been a little bit better to take with the pawn to at least keep the rooks on the board, keep it a little bit more dynamic. Um, but even here after bishop e3, um, white is following this up with c4, c5. I think white is just doing um, really, really well. So, um, yeah, in the game we saw rook takes c4, takes, takes, king f2. A good instinct, just bringing in the king. Um, now black uh, desperately needs to try something like f5 and just try to get the pawns rolling, but white is doing uh, very well here. Um, instead, black gives this check provokes g3 and, and drops back, but I wouldn't really call this such a great provocation. I think this is a move white is happy to make anyway, and yeah, all black uh, has done is just lose some time. Because now white gets c4, bishop b6, king e3. Um, a very good move, not being afraid of the pin, because white knows that they're just going to play b4, c5 next, and there's no way black can do anything with the pin uh, in the meantime. And so white's pawns are just rolling, and, and white is just crushing. F5 is tried, B4, black tries a desperate trick, but yeah, G takes F4, and there's simply not enough here. Now we end up going into the uh, opposite color bishop endgame here, but since white has so many pawns, um, white should be able to just win this one easily. Joe does blunder <laughs> here with D7, uh, forgets that black can return with king to E7 and actually uh, take this pawn. Um, but even so, um, white's two pawns on uh, the queen side I should say that remaining pawns uh, are still good enough to win the game. And yeah, because white's king is very active here, um, black just has no way of setting up any kind of blockade. And uh, fortunately for Joe, this is still a winning position for white. So he was able to um, just convert this one by promoting the pawns. Um, so yeah, this last mistake definitely wasn't necessary with d7, although it doesn't really spoil anything. b5 was probably a lot simpler. Um, and just running the B pawn, but um, yeah, anyway, the game was winning the whole time. And I should say, quite an interesting game. I mean, hopefully uh, the ideas we looked at were pretty useful uh, to those of you watching the video. Um, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this one. So hopefully you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please make sure to do so. Um, and yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comment section. All right, hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you next time. Take care.